This is the Parliament Channel and Parliament Radio 105.5 FM. Speak up. Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen. Amen. Namaste. or affirmation announcements by the speaker. Honorable members, Mrs. Ramona Ramdial, MP, member for Coover North, has asked to be excused from sittings of the House during the period November 1st to the 30th, 2017. The Honorable Shamfa Kujo, MP, member for Tobago West. Mrs. Vidya Gayadin Gopi Singh, MP, member for Orapooch East, West, and the Honorable Maxi Coffey, MP, member for La Hoketa, Talparo, have asked to be excused from today's sitting of the House. The leave which the members seek is granted. Honorable members, I also have some correspondence from the President of the Senate, dated November 8th, 2017. Dear Honorable members, I wish to advise that at a sitting held on Tuesday, October 24, 2017, the Senate concurred with the House by agreeing to the following resolution. Resolved that the Gambling, Gaming and Betting Control Bill 2016 and the Cybercrime Bill 2017 be referred to respective Joint Select Committees for consideration and that these committees be mandated to adopt the work of the Joint Select Committees appointed in the second session, 11th Parliament, and report by March 31st, 2018. 
Accordingly, I respectfully request that the House of Representatives be informed of this decision at the earliest convenience, please. Respectfully, Senator, the Honorable Christine Kangaloo, President of the Senate. Honorable members, at the first sitting of this third session, held on Friday, September 29, 2017, the member for Separia and leader of the opposition was granted leave to raise a motion of privilege in accordance with Standing Order 32. I indicated then that I would give my ruling at a later sitting. I have since carefully deliberated upon the motion that was presented by the member for Separia. The facts are that the Prime Minister and member for De Digo Martin West is reported to have, been, have made certain statements to members of the media while being interviewed at a public event held on September 16, 2017. As we all know, members of Parliament regularly engage in public discourse outside of Parliament. Members speak at political rallies, town meetings, media conferences, and television and radio talk shows. And I wish to seize this opportunity to remind all members that our words, whether uttered inside this august chamber or spoken in another forum, as well as our conduct, ought always to maintain respect, dignity, and decorum. Indeed, a wealth of case law has developed over time in relation to words spoken by parliamentarians outside of the parliament and their legal implications and effect. My role as guardian of the privileges of this house is to balance two principles. The principle that parliament should be protected from improper obstruction of its functions, and the principle of freedom of comment of members of parliament and citizens to criticize the institution or membership of the parliament. In determining whether a prima facie case exists in the instant circumstance. And while balancing the aforementioned two important principles, the following learnings assisted with my deliberations. During debate on a breach of privilege in the House of Commons and in relation to freedom of comment, Gladstone stated as follows. Breach of privilege is a very wide net and it would be very undesirable that notice should be taken in this house of all cases in which honorable members are unfairly criticized. Breach of privilege is not exactly to be defined. It is rather to be held in the air, to be exercised on proper occasions when, in the opinion of the house, a fit case for its exercise occurs. To put this weapon unduly in force is to invite a combat upon unequal terms, wheresoever and by whomsoever carried on. Indeed, it is absolutely necessary that there should be freedom of comment. In 2000, Speaker Hunt of the New Zealand House of Representatives rules as follows, and I quote, for a statement to constitute a contempt by reflecting on members, it would have to allege corruption or impropriety on the part of members in their capacity as members. Hard-hitting and contentious comments and statements to which members might well object fall within the boundaries of acceptable political interchange. End quote. Applying the learnings above, I am of the considered view that while some may find the statement attributed to the Honorable Prime Minister objectionable, it is insufficient to meet the threshold required to find a prima facie case of a breach of privilege. The statement made is too remote to attribute a reflection on the members, presiding officers, or staff of the parliament. It is vague and lacks the specificity required to qualify as a reflection on a member or on the house. I wish to quote from the practice and procedure of the Rajaya Sabha, and I quote, Speech or write, speeches or writings containing vague charges against members or criticizing their parliamentary conduct in a strong language, particularly in the heat of a public controversy without, however, 
imputing any malafides and not treated by the House as a contempt or breach of privilege, end quote. Upon analysis, the statement does not go beyond the realm of political comment, and it is too wide to be interpreted by a reasonable person to have brought the Parliament into disrepute and odium or impute any malafides. As Speaker of the House, I find it inconsistent with the dignity of the House to take any serious notice or action in the case of every offensive statement which may technically constitute a reflection on the House. I myself have heard comments made by many other members in the public domain, which, if held to a strict interpretation of privilege, could well fall into the category of a reflection. It is for these reasons that I find no prima facie breach of privilege warranting the attention of this House, and I sue. Bills brought from the Senate, petitions, papers. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have the honor to lay the following papers. Provisional Collection of Taxes Order 2017, the Audited Financial Statements of Trinidad and Tobago Creative Industries Company for the financial year ended September 30th, 2015, the Audited Financial Statements of Palaseco Agricultural Enterprises Limited for the financial year ended September 30th, 2016, the Annual Report and Audited Financial Statements of National Enterprises Limited for the financial year ended March 31st, 2017. The audited financial statements of Carney 1975 Limited for the financial year ended June 30th, 2017. Papers 6 to 7, the report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, Children Authority Fund for the years ended September 30th, 2014 and 2015. Second report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Sugar Industry Labor Welfare Committee for the nine months ended September 30th, 1998. The report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Mayor's Fund of the Chaguanas Borough Corporation for the year ended September 30th, 2013. 10 to 11, the annual audited financial statements of the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission for the years ended December 31st, 2014 and 2015. 12 to 15, the annual administrative reports of Caribbean Airlines Limited for the years ended 2010 to 2013. And 16 to 18, the annual administrative reports of the Trinidad and Tobago Tourism Business Development Limited for the years ended December 31st, 2013 to December 31st, 2015. I beg to move that papers two to five be referred to the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee and papers six to 11 be referred to the Public Accounts Committee. Honorable members, the question is that papers two to five be referred to the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee and papers six to 11 be referred to the Public Accounts Committee. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. The leader of the house. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Papers 19, 31, 46, 50, 54, 56, and 59. These papers represent the responses to the fourth report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination of the system of internal audit within the public service. These responses are from the Ministry of Finance, the Registration, Recognition, and Certification Board, the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, the Ministry of Community Development, Culture, and the Arts, the Office of the Prime Minister, the Ministry of Tourism, and the Ministry of Planning and Development. Madam Speaker, I also lay the ministerial response of the Ministry of Finance to the eighth report of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee on the examination of the audited accounts, balance sheet, and other financial statements of the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago 
for the financial years 2009 to 2015. The ministerial response of the Ministry of National Security to the third report of the Joint Select Committee on National Security on an inquiry into the operations of the Trinidad and Tobago Forensic Science Center and the issue of DNA sampling in Trinidad and Tobago. Papers 27 and 28, which are the responses of the, to the fourth report of the Joint Select Committee on National Security on an inquiry into prison security and the status of the investigation into the Port of Spain prison break of July 24, 2015. These responses are from the Ministry of National Security and the Service Commission's Department. Paper 35, the ministerial response of the Ministry of Public Administration and Communications to the second report of the Public Administration and Appropriations <coughs> sorry, Committee on an examination of the current expenditure and internal controls of the Office of the President. Paper 55, which is the ministerial response of the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs to the first report of the Joint Select Committee on Foreign Affairs on the public examination of the draft summary of the recommendations and conclusions of the 41st meeting of the Council for Trade and Economic Development. Paper 61, which is the final report of the Police Manpower Audit Committee. Paper 62, which is the report of the team appointed to review the operations of Petrotrin and make recommendations for its restructuring. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that Paper 61 be referred to the Joint Select Committee on National Security and Paper 62 be referred to the Joint Select Committee on Energy Affairs. Honorable members, the question is that Paper 61 be referred to the Joint Select Committee on National Security and Paper 62 be referred to the Joint Select Committee on Energy Affairs. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? The ayes have it. The Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Leader of the House. Yes, thank you. Madam Speaker, I would like to lay the following paper, which is on the second supplemental order paper. That is paper number 63, the annual report of the operations of the Interception of Communications Act for the period January to December 2012. And Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government, I have the honor to lay the following papers. <coughs> Excuse me. Paper 21, the Administrative Report and Audited Financial Statements of Palo Seco Agricultural Enterprises Limited for the periods October 1st, 2012 to September 30th, 2013. Papers 22 and 23, the Annual Administrative Reports of the Point Fortin Borough Corporation for the periods October 1st, 2012 to September 30th, 2013 and October 1st, 2013 to September 30th, 2014. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. The Minister of Education. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following papers. The annual report of the Teaching Service Commission for the fiscal year 2013, and the administrative report of the National Institute of Higher Education, Research, Science, and Technology for fiscal year 2014. Thank you. The Deputy Speaker. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay paper number 29, the annual report of the Statutory Authority Service Commission for the year ending September 2016. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay on behalf of the Minister of Public Administration and Communication. Sorry, sorry, Madam Speaker. Oh, sorry, Madam Speaker. 
Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, I have the honor to lay paper number 30, the annual administrative report of the Industrial Relations Advisory Committee for the period March to September 2015. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister of Public Administration and Communications. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Public Administration and Communications, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Paper number 32, the eighth report of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission on the exercise of the Commission's functions and powers for the years 2008 to 2016. Paper number 33, the 106th report of the Salaries Review Commission of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Paper number 34, the annual report of the National Information and Communication Technology Company Limited, IGOF TT, for the year ended September 30th, 2016. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Papers 36 and 37, the annual administrative reports of the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industry, in the, sorry, the annual administrative reports of the Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs for the fiscal years 2013 and 2014. Papers 38 to 45, the annual administrative reports of the National Energy Corporation of Trinidad and Tobago Limited for the years ended December 31st, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, and 2015. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. The Minister of Social Development and Family Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following papers. The annual administrative reports of the Ministry of the People and Social Development for the fiscal years 2012-2013 and 2013-2014. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Minister of Community Development, Culture and the Arts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the annual administrative report of the former Ministry of Community Development for fiscal 2010-2011. The Attorney General. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the annual report of the Police Complaints Authority for the period October 1st, 2015 to September 30th, 2016. The Prime Minister. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Honorable Prime Minister, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Paper number 52, the annual report of the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago for the year ended September 30th, 2016. And paper number 53, the administrative report of the Office of the Prime Minister for the period October 1st, 2015 to September 30th, 2016. Minister of Trade and Industry. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. On behalf of the Minister of Trade and Industry, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Papers 57 and 58, the administrative reports of the Betting Levy Board for the years ended June 30th, 2015 and 2016. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member for Tobago East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the delegation report on the Regional Parliamentarians Forum, follow-up to the United Nations High-Level Political Declaration on Ending AIDS, hosted by Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV-AIDS and United Nations Development Program, held in Kingston, Jamaica, May 30th to 31st, 2017. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Reports from committees, Prime Minister's questions, urgent questions. The member for Miaru. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Question number one to the Minister of Works and Transport. And Transport. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the soil tests and surveys were carried out and the design work is ongoing. 
We expect work to start in the second quarter of fiscal 2018. Thank you. M Member Fumiaro. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, question number two to the Minister of Social Development and Family Services. Could Madam Speaker. Ma ma just one minute, Member, it's an urgent question, so you'll have to yeah, read the sure. question. Could the Minister state when will support grants be given out to affected communities in the aftermath of destructive flooding in the Mayaro Rio Claro area and a large number of persons affected? The Minister of Social Development and Family Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Social Development and Family Service says having received clearance to enter the affected areas on the 23rd of October 2017, immediately commenced the assessments of the households. We have, we have visited 2,615 households in affected areas thus far. As at the 9th of November 2017, which was yesterday, we would have distributed 127 relief checks to the respective regional offices. In terms of Rio Claro, Mayaro, the ministry is currently preparing 78 checks, and those checks are supposed to be provided to those areas by Monday. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Member for Karani Central. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Could the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries please indicate why employees of the Forestry Division have not been paid for several fortnights? The Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Madam Speaker, I am answering on behalf of the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Thank you very kindly for the question. Madam Speaker, at the end of the last financial year, Cabinet approved an allocation of $22 million to the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries to settle all outstanding wages to workers in the reforestation program. With the new financial year and the approval of the budget at the end of October 2017, wages are due now for two fortnights and the ministry is awaiting releases to pay the workers. Madam Speaker, the, the workers were paid for August and September and are now owed for two fortnights in October. Member for Karani Central, supplementary. Speaker, yes. My, my information from at least two workers were that their, their, their government was four months, sorry, four fortnights in arrears. <coughs> And I'm not disputing what you're saying, but this was the information from the... So I want to ask, I mean, there is a lot of hardship involved here. How, Remember, we have 15 how questions be, to ask question. How can this be resolved? When will they be paid? Madam Speaker, else. thank you very kindly. As I said, the information that is before me is that there are two fortnights owed, and that is two fortnights in October and we are, waiting, we are awaiting releases for those two fortnights, and they will be paid as soon as we get the releases. Member for Karani Central. To Minister of Planning and Development, given the recent oil spill uh, in Shagaramas, could the minister indicate whether it is legal for oil tankers to dock at Pier 1 in Shagaramas. Minister of Planning and Development. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the CDA has jurisdiction over the land of the Shagaramas Peninsula up to the high water mark, but does not have jurisdiction over the sea. Such jurisdiction lies with the Commissioner of State Lands and Maritime Services and the Maritime Services Division of the Ministry of Works and Transport. However, the board of the CDA at its meeting held on November 2nd, 2017, agreed that no lease shall be granted to a company who wishes to conduct business of oil storage or oil bunkering or storing of oil-related chemicals. Pair One's permitted use according to its deed of lease is one, to establish a cruise ship facility for embarkation of passengers and cargo, and which will cater extensively to, for social gatherings, conferences, excursions, day, night, and sunset cruises, and a wide range of water sports, 
which will include sailing, windsurfing, canoeing, diving, snorkeling, paddle boating, fishing where possible, and swimming. Two, to establish a mar marina f facility for servicing pleasure crafts and ships, and three, to establish for the better enjoyment of these facilities, a bar, a restaurant, sports facilities, a clubhouse, a jetty, and car park. Given that the spirit of the lease speaks to servicing pleasure crafts and ships, advice was sought from senior counsel on whether the tenant could in fact service oil vessels. The board of the CDA at its meeting held on November 2nd, 2017, agreed that no lease shall be granted to a company who wishes to conduct the business of oil storage or oil bunkering or storing of oil-related chemicals. Thank you very much. Member for Carney Central. Thank you for the answer. And I simply ask, could we now expect then that no oil tankers would be attached to the Pier 1 jetty? Minister Planning Development. Yes, that is to be expected. Member for Kareny East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Honorable Minister of Health, could the Minister provide the reasons why critical laboratory blood investigations, which are required for saving patients' lives, are unavailable at the San Fernando General Hospital? Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I thank the member for the question. Of the tests not currently not available at Southwest, not all are critical. For example, the tests for marijuana and cocaine are not critical. The two that we are concerned about, honorable member, are creatinine and troponin. In the example of creatinine, arrangements have already been made for North Central to take over that testing for the time being. In the, in the case of troponin, and let me just explain, troponin is a protein produced by cardiac muscle. Uh, you test those levels to determine whether somebody has had a heart attack or not. In San Fernando, that test will normally take between 12 to 18 hours. The new technology we now have at Eric Williams, we can now give a person a result within two hours because we have recently bought a high sensitive troponin machine. So no one at San Fernando is being disadvantaged. As a matter of fact, we will take the samples from San Fernando, send it to Eric Williams with the new state-of-the-art technology to test for troponin, and people in San Fernando will get your results even faster than what currently applied. So that is what we are doing, and I thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Karen, is supplemental. Minister, are you aware that the delay in the investigation for creatinine, particularly in patients who are impending renal failure, there's possible death of the patient while waiting for the result. And secondly. One question. Yeah. One question. One question. And I agree with you fully, and that is why we are also engaged in the private sector for creatinine, so nobody will be disadvantaged. I thank you very much. Karen, you have a supplement on yes? While the patient is waiting for the results or the doctors are waiting for the results in the hospitals, are you aware that the patients die while waiting for the results from the private labs because these take some time, a day or two, for the labs, for the results to come back to the hospital doctors? I have absolutely no data to support that very, very dangerous statement that you have made. If you have that data, please supply it to me. Member for Kearney, East question six. To the Minister of Education. Could the Minister state why the Ministry of Education has not paid school social workers, about 60, their outstanding monthly salaries to date? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, at present, school social workers are on month-to-month -month contracts. They were paid up to the 20th of September, 2017. The Ministry of Education was awaiting releases from the Ministry of Finance. Releases have since been obtained 
and the information that I have is that those payments will be made very early next week. Thank you very much. Member for Carney, e supplementary. Does the Honourable Minister remember that in about April of 2017, you indicated that these school social workers will be given three-year contracts? As a supplemental All question. All right, okay. All right, thanks. <laughs> Member for Point of Pale. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Social Development and Family Services, to the Minister, based on recent reports that 36 residents of sea lots have been displaced due to their homes being destroyed by fire, could the Minister state the measures taken to provide relief to these affected residents? Minister of Social Development and Family Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services, through its National Family Services Unit and Social Welfare Division, has been liaising with the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Services in order to identify the persons so affected. Those who have been affected to date, the Ministry would have met with those affected persons. We have provided them with food support. We have also provided information on the benefits to which they, benefits that they can access as a result of the disaster they would have faced. And this includes rental assistance. However, Madam Speaker, all of the affected persons we have spoken to thus far have indicated that they have received or accessed alternative accommodation so they do not require the rental assistance. We have also informed them about the school supplies grant, which would replace all uniforms and books to a maximum of 700 for primary school children and $1,000 for secondary school. We also would have provided information on the fact that house repairs, they can access the house repairs grant, the school supplies grant, and the replacement of household items. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Kabuto Mantinella, supplemental question. Thank you, Madam. Speaker. Honorable Minister, can you advise how many persons have uh, in fact applied for the house grant? Minister of Social Development and Family Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, thus far, none of the individuals have applied for the house grant. Member for Kamuto Mantanella. Is there any indication at all that any would not be, um, be eligible to apply because of a, a lack of a land deed? Member, I will not allow that as a supplemental question. Member for Princess Town. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, through you to the Honorable Minister of Education. Question number eight. In light of recent demolition of the Princess Town Presbyterian School, could the Minister indicate when would construction commence? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Works had ordered the, the demolition of the Princess Town Presbyterian No. 2 Primary School. This was done during the July-August vacation period 2017. Pupils are now housed at the Princess Town Presbyterian No. 1 Primary School. At this time, I am unable to state when the construction of the new school will begin. Thank you. Member for Princess Town. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, through you to the Honorable Minister for Works and Transport. Question number nine. In light of recent protests on the Naparima Mayara Road, could the Minister indicate when remedial works would commence? Minister of Works and Transport. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, remedial work on, on this road is expected to commence at the beginning of January 2018 through the PR program. This will include road works and drainage. In the meantime, patching work is ongoing. Thank you. For Princess Town. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister, can you indicate whether or not there has been any soil testing with respect to this particular area? Because this has been an ongoing problem that requires really a long-term solution. And therefore, we have seen in the past where seconds, this continues. Member for Princess Town. So if there's any additional soil testing that is being done with respect to Minister long term. Minister and Transport. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Before the pure unit engage in any work, once it's required, boreholes 
uh, done to ensure that the, the soil is, is stable and to at least recommend to the, the contractor what is required. Thank you. As the time for urgent question is now spent. Questions on notice. Requests for leave to move the adjournment of the House on definite matters of urgent public importance. Member for Carney East. Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 17 of the House of Representatives, I hereby seek leave to move the adjournment of the House at its sitting today, 10th November 2017, for the purpose of discussing a de definitive matter of urgent public importance, namely the failure of the government to manage a crisis with respect to the school feeding program. The matter is definite because it directly and adversely impacts on the nutrition of thousands of students in need of school meals as the facilities of many caterers which are now existing with possible closure as a result of long outstanding payments for May, June, September and October 2017 to school feeding caterers. The matter is urgent because it currently affects the nutrition, health, and welfare of thousands of school children who need the meals at school on a daily basis throughout Trinidad and Tobago. The matter is of public importance because the National Schools Dietary Services Limited are in possible breach of the contract with caterers with a non-payment for services rendered to the Ministry of Education with approximately 1,000 lunches and 50,000 breakfast meals being provided on a daily basis by these caterers to approximately 800 schools. Members, I find that this matter does not qualify under Standing Order 17. The member may pursue this matter under Standing Order 16. Statements by ministers, personal explanations, introduction of bills. On the third supplemental order paper, the state suits limitation number two bill, 2017, in the name of the Attorney General. The registration of titles to land amendment number two bill, 2017, in the name of the Attorney General, the Land Tribunal Amendment Number 2 Bill 2017, in the name of the Attorney General, and the Land Adjudication Amendment Number 2 Bill 2017, in the name of the Attorney General. Motions relating to the business or sittings of the House and moved by a Minister. Public business, government business, motions. The Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas it is provided by Section 3.1 of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act, Chapter 7401, here and after referred to as the Act, that where proposals for general <coughs> or supplemental appropriation of public funds are made to the House of Representatives, and are embodied in an appropriation bill or a supplementary appropriation bill, the President may, for the purpose of raising revenue, to meet the expenditure specified in any such bill, by order, provide for the imposition of a tax or the variation of an existing tax. And from the date of the publication of the order in Trinidad and Tobago, in the Trinidad and Tobago Gazette, the tax as imposed or varied shall be payable. And whereas it is provided by Section 3.5 of the Act that an order varying an existing tax shall cease to have effect if the order is not confirmed with or without modifications by a resolution agreed to by the House within the next 21 days after the commencement of the order. 
and whereas the Provisional Collection of Taxes Order 2017, hereafter, hereinafter referred to as the order, made under Section 3 of the Act, provided for the variation of taxes in the written laws mentioned in the order to the extent and in the manner set out therein, for the purpose of raising revenue to meet the expenditure specified in the bill entitled an act to provide for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending on the 30th day of September 2018. And whereas the order was published in the Trinidad and Tobago Gazette as legal notice number 117 of 2017 on the 23rd day of October 2017 and commenced on the 23rd day of October 2017, and whereas it is expedient to confirm the order, be it resolved that the Provisional Collection of Taxes Order 2017 be confirmed subject to the following modifications in paragraph 5F A by deleting subparagraphs 3 and 10 and B by renumbering subparagraphs 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 11 as subparagraphs 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, respectively. Madam Speaker, this is a copy of the legal supplement that was published in the Gazette on the 23rd of October 2017. And I think it is necessary to explain how this process works. In the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act, there is a requirement or a provision for the publication of an order that would vary existing taxes or impose new taxes. The Act requires that this order be brought to the House of Representatives and not the Senate after a period of four days has expired and before a period of 21 days expires. So that this order was published on the 23rd of October and the 21 day period therefore would expire if my maths is correct on the 11th or 12th of November, 18th? We're on the 18th day today. On the 18th day today. Thank you, Attorney General. So we're well within the time frame. This is a bit of an anachronism and a bit of a cake legislation because this uh, law was enacted many years ago when we did not have the current um, process of examination of the estimates in the Standing Finance Committee or at least we did not have the current period of time that we spend in the budget debate and then the examination of the estimates. So it has created quite a, a bit of a difficulty for us in the Ministry of Finance because you are allowed to publish the order while the bill is still before the House of Representatives. So I was entitled to publish the order up to the Thursday, the last day of the Standing Finance Committee. But after that, as when the bill went to the Senate, the time expired for the publication of the order. And this is why we published it on the 23rd of October. And this is something that will have to be changed. Because what, what it causes, because of the, the new and different time frames now, is that you, you, you find yourself very pressed for time in terms of when this order is to be published and when you have to come to the House of Representatives to confirm it. So in the future, I'm just giving notice, we may bring proposals to stretch it out maybe to 30 days or 40 days or something like that to give us the breathing space because after the budget exercise, we're all quite exhausted uh, having been here for so many days, you know, from morning to evening. So that is something we're going to change. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm glad it wasn't mine. It happens <coughs> to the best of us. <laughs> so, as I was saying, 
this is something we're going to change. We're going to make proposals to change the time periods for the confirmation of the provisional collection of taxes order, but in due course, not right now. So that now we're within the existing time frames. And in this order, arising from the fiscal measures announced in the budget 2018, you will see from the order that the order makes adjustments to the taxes payable on gambling tables and other devices. It makes adjustments to the taxes and duties applicable to motor vehicles and motorcycles, and it makes adjustments to the taxes on cars for motor vehicles and also on taxes imposed on amusement gaming machines. Madam Speaker, when I presented the budget on the 2nd of October, I highlighted the urgent need for a paradigm shift in order to place this economy, this country's economy on a sustainable path. In order to achieve this shift, Madam Speaker, it is critical that the government seeks to control expenditure and maximize revenue collection as a mean of balancing our fiscal accounts. The provisions in the order that I just spoke about are consistent with that objective. Section 3.5 of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act provides that where an order varies a tax, as we see in the resolution before the House, that, well, we don't see it in the resolution, but this is in the Act, that that tax shall cease to have effect if the Provisional Collection of Taxes order is not confirmed with or without modification by a resolution agreed to by the House within the next 21 days. If the resolution is not agreed, then the provisional collection of taxes order ceases to have effect, it lapses. So we must pass this motion, we must approve this motion today. <coughs> Let me go now and give some details on what exactly is in that order. I'll start with the gambling and gaming industry. It is believed, Madam Speaker, that there are no more than 20,000, and I will have to rely on persons who know a little bit more about this than I do, like the member for Tabakit. He has cited some numbers in this house. But it is believed there are more than 20,000 amusement gaming machines in Trinidad and Tobago. <coughs> the provisional collection of taxes order that we are debating amended Section 20B of the Liquor License Act and increased the gaming tax payable annually on amusement games. This is the amusement slot machine type device that I'm told one would see in bars and so on. I've never seen one. I don't frequent bars. But the ta gaming tax payable annually was increased by the order from $3,000 per year to $6,000. This increased gaming tax is applicable to amusement games operated on licensed premises under the Liquor License Act. It is intended that this measure will come into effect on the 1st of January 2018, so it's not in effect now, and is expected to increase revenues by approximately $60 million per year with full compliance. Establishments licensed under the Liquor License Act are entitled to operate up to 20 amusement gaming devices. At the time when the provision was introduced many years ago, the machines were designed to allow just one player to play at a time. I'm told, again, I have to rely on reports because I don't know anything about this. I've never used one of these machines. Sure. Definitely sure, <laughs> but I'm told that this is, not even privately, I'm told that this is no longer the case. Within recent times, establishments licensed under the Liquor License Act have begun to operate electronic roulette devices, which permit, and I heard the member for Tabakit say, mm -hmm, 
as I said, he is a repository of information with respect to gambling, which permit as many as 12 pay players to wager as frequently as every 20 seconds. Now, this is interesting. So we now have roulette devices in bars and recreation clubs and restaurants, I assume. Well, this tells me 12, allowing as many as 12 players to wager as frequently as every 20 seconds, three times a minute. Now, Madam Speaker, after I was visited by some persons at my private residence, a lot of people contacted me, a lot of people contacted me to provide me with information that I did not have before. And I was told that one of these roulette machines, because of the fact that it's spinning every 20 seconds, three times a minute, I understand it's the ball spins around a rotating um, device and, and it falls on a number. And if you put your bet on that number, you win. I'm told that when you do the calculation, if you have one of these roulette devices with workers operating on a shift system, seven days a week, two shifts a day, if you calculate the number of times that the roulette machine will display the, the, the winning number, and you work out the odds and the number of bets on these roulette tables that a single roulette machine, one roulette machine that is operated 24-7, well, not 24-7, but on a double shift system, maybe 12 hours a day, I, I, I expect. One roulette machine, after paying the wages of the workers and the overheads of the club, and the tax imposed by the government, one roulette machine can generate somewhere between 500,000 and a million dollars. One machine. When you do the maths, because three times a minute, the ball is dropping in the slot. And this thing is operating 12 hours a day, 365 days a year. Now, if that is true, if that is true, that one roulette machine can generate at least $500,000 in profit for its owner, then I think it's not believable because I'm told that when you work out the wages, the wages element, let's say this device generates a million dollars in gross revenue. The wages element, no, that's the profit I'm talking about. The wages element, I'm told, might be $150,000 per year. That's what, that's what they, they did the calculation for me, that the wage of the worker, how many hours they work, how much they will get in a day, and they do a dual sh shift system. So you have two workers, they work out the wages of the two workers operating that machine. They say it will be about $150,000 a year total. And when you take the gross revenue of the machine, the wages of the worker, overheads in the club, and any other expenses they may have, you would gross sorry, you would, you would earn profit of at least $500,000 on each one of those machines. So why on God's earth would, if the tax is raised from 60000 to 120000 and you're making $500,000 on the machine, why on God's earth would you send home the worker? I mean, that worker that you're paying 150000 or 75000 is generating $500,000 in profit. It doesn't make any sense. So that... I was given this information to show how the concerns that are out there are not realistic. Because why on earth would you retrench a worker that is earning for you $500,000 a year on one single machine? But let's move along. Madam Speaker, the Liquor Licenses Act prescribes a flat tax of $3,000 per amusement game. 
I'm told that the tax was applied on a per seat basis for electronic roulette devices. In, that, in this regard, the total tax charge per device is $36,000. So you have a roulette table with 12 people, 12 persons, so it's $3,000 per seat per roulette table. So the total tax charge per device is currently $36,000 per year. But Madam Speaker, given the peculiar nature of this particular device, and I'm told that's the real money spinner, it ought to receive distinct treatment from the other electronic gaming devices. To this end, a flat tax of $120,000 will be applied to electronic roulette devices. The new tax is at paragraph six of the order, which amended section 20B of the Liquor Licenses Act. Previously, the term electronic roulette device was not defined in the Liquor Licenses Act as it fell to be included in the class of all amusement games. However, given the decision to provide a separate tax treatment in respect of these devices, our definition has become necessary. The order thus includes a definition of the term electronic roulette devices by an amendment to section 20B of the Liquor License Act. The electronic roulette device that I am speaking about means a gaming device that automatically spins a ball around a mechanical roulette wheel and determines the outcome of a round of play via electronic sensors. This tax, this new tax, for electronic roulette devices will come into effect on the 1st of January 2018 as expected to increase revenue by approximately $84 million once there is full compliance. With respect to gaming tables and other devices, I am told, Madam Speaker, and it's clear, that the gambling industry in Trinidad and Tobago is booming. The amount of money circulating from players in the industry is estimated to be of the order of 15 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars. The country, however, does not receive its fair share of taxes from the gaming sector, despite the size of the industry, the number of people involved, and the revenue generated. In fact, the taxes, the taxes collected for the last fiscal year were in the vicinity of 58 million dollars. So you have an industry where the estimated amount of money circulating per year is in the order of $15 billion, but the taxes collected only $58 million. If you do the maths, you will see that's a minuscule percentage. Madam Speaker, in view of this unregulated industry, with these minimal tax collections, the it decision was taken to increase the taxes on gaming tables and other gambling devices listed in the Schedule to the Registration of Clubs Act by 100%. This is in paragraph two of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Order, which amended the Schedule to the Registration of Clubs Act. Again, this measure will come into effect on the 1st of January 2018 and is expected to increase revenues by an additional $331 million per year with full compliance. I'm told, Madam Speaker, that electronic roulette devices that I spoke about are not only being used in bars and recreation clubs that are licensed under the Liquor License Act, but are also widely used in members' clubs. However, electronic roulette devices are not now specifically listed in the Schedule to the Registration of Clubs Act but are included as part of the line item, every other table or device not mentioned above. In this regard, the, the devices have attracted a flat tax of $30,000 annually. As I said before, these devices can accommodate as many as 12 players at a time, and as I said, giving a win every 20 seconds and earning as much as $500,000 in profit for its owner. In order for there to be parity in charging to tax of these devices with those found in establishments under the Liquor License Act, the Schedule to the Registration of Clubs Act will be amended to add electronic roulette devices as a separate gaming table to the list of gaming tables and other devices. The tax of $120,000 per year 
will now be imposed on these electronic roulette devices. The roulette devices will therefore not be in the category of tables or other devices not previously mentioned, which attracts a lower device. Paragraph two of the order provides for this, and again, this will come into effect on the 1st of January 2018. Madam Speaker, we have also increased the customs duty on all mechanical game, games of chance by 100%. The rate of duty was 20%, it will now be 40%. This increase was achieved by paragraph 5, F, 9, 10, and 11 of the order. You will also note, Madam Speaker, that the resolution before you intends to confirm the order subject to paragraph 5, F, X being deleted. This is because there is confusion over exactly what is a video console as it relates to a gambling machine or a video console such as a PlayStation, a PS4, or one of these um, toys that children use to play, and men too, and women, used to play video games. Mm. So we thought it necessary to remove the particular item in the order in this motion so that there will be no confusion as to whether video games like Nintendo and so on would attract the new duty of 40%. This increase in customs duty on mechanical games of chance is expected to increase revenues by an additional $5 million. Now, Madam Speaker, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of things published. Uh, I do from time to time read the newspapers. And I did see an advertisement from an uh, entity calling itself the Members Club Association. And I saw in their newspaper advertisement that in response to an allegation that the owners of these clubs are in hiding, the advertisement says, by law, private members' clubs are owned by club members. Well, I will deal with that in a short while, because that is a fiction. That is an absolute fiction. But in order to give some understanding of what is going on in Trinidad and Tobago, I have in my possession the current list of all members' clubs in Trinidad and Tobago. There are 221 members' clubs at this time. And if you went back into the records, you would have seen there's been an explosion in the numbers of members' clubs over the last couple of years. So there are 221 members' clubs in Trinidad and Tobago. But in terms of bars and recreation clubs, there are, believe it or not, 686 that are on the records at the Board of Inland Revenue. So when you add the two together, you're talking about 900 more or less establishments where you have gambling and gaming devices of one kind or another. But what is interesting, this is the Board of Inland Revenue Records, 686 bars and recreation clubs and restaurants and so on that have these things and 221 private members' clubs, which is just a fancy name for a casino. But when you check with the list of private members' clubs that are registered with the Financial Intelligence Unit, you only get 97. So the Board of Inland Revenue has 900 members' clubs, stroke casino, plus bars, restaurants, and so on. 900, 900 on the records at the Board of Indian Revenue, 97 on the records at the Financial Intelligence Unit. Mm. I leave that for members to draw their own conclusions. What it means that 800 of these organizations are not being monitored 
by the Financial Intelligence Unit at this time, 800 of them. Madam Speaker, I also saw in this advertisement, <laughs> I mean, you know, if it wasn't, you know, thing to, to, to be laugh for, you must cry, a thing to cry for, you must laugh. I see something here about the casino industry in Las Vegas. Yeah. Profit making its profit. first profit in 2008. I say things to cry about, you know, you have to laugh. Madam Speaker, I have in my possession a paper published by the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. It's a 2013, 2013 paper and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, gave details on the revenue generated, the revenue earned by casinos in Las Vegas in 2013. 14 billion US dollars. 100 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars. That's, that's what is declared. You know, it could, it could be more. So when I look at this and I see that this, and this is 2013, eh? it could be more now. So $14 billion in casin, casino revenue in 2013. US, eh? $14 billion US. And I hear this thing about Las Vegas only declared a profit. <laughs> Come on, give me a break. And Madam Speaker, I also checked other states in the United States. Philadelphia, I'm told, is the second largest revenue earner in terms of gambling and gaming. And, f and casinos in Philadelphia, they generated in excess of a billion dollars last year and paid 200 million US dollars in taxes to the state of Philadelphia. So publication like this neglect to report that in these countries, substantial taxes are paid by casino operators and casino owners. And just use that state of Philadelphia alone, they would have paid somewhere in the vicinity of 1.4 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars in taxes on revenue of about 10 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars. So they, they paid about 14, 15% of their gross revenue was paid in taxes to the state of Philadelphia. So it has nothing to do with whatever profit they, they make. The fact of the matter is that 15% of revenues in the state of Philadelphia are paid in taxes every year to the state government. And of course, when you check the other numbers, uh, the, the, the revenue generation in the whole United States in um, from casino gambling, you're talking about $100 billion US, Madam Speaker, $100 billion US. That's what you're talking about. So, I mean, I really can't respond in any great detail to these numbers here because they are not consistent with the facts. They are so far from the facts, it's not funny. And Madam Speaker, I also, saw, I also want to go back to this comment about these casinos are owned by the members. I'm told, Again, I've never been to one. That you can just walk in, sign a book. They give you a tem temporary membership card. You go and lose all your money. And then you go back out and you're no longer a member. You're a member for a couple hours until, you, until your money done. But I have in my possession a, a decision delivered on the 24th of May 2017. So it's a very current decision. And it's in the matter of the Companies Act. And in the matter of 44 Limited and Club Princess Limited, between Dallas Corporation, Thomas Baker, and Alnando Corporation, Sudi Ozkan, Zafir Yunal, Chrislyn Moore, famous name, 44 Limited and Club Princess Limited. And this was a dispute over the ownership and the revenues from a casino in Trinidad. 
the same casino that they say owned by the members. And it makes very interesting reading, because that is not so at all. I go to page four of the judgment, delivered in, in May 2017, and the factual background reported by the judge is that in and around 2004 to 2005, the second defendant, and Charles Frost, the second defendant, would be Sudi Oscan, met to discuss and agree to establish a casino business in Trinidad. You, if you listen to what others say, you would be told there are no casinos, only members clubs. But in this judgment, the judge is reporting that these two individuals met to discuss and agree to establish a casino business in Trinidad. The agreement stipulated that the business was to be equally owned between the two of them and the profits equally shared from the business. Now, how can you have profits from a business with two shareholders who are sharing all the profits when, according to this, the members' clubs are owned by the members? So you're telling me this members' club only have two owners? I mean, two members? <coughs> Ridiculous. So it went on to speak about the dispute between these two people who had established this casino in Trinidad. And the dispute was over the issuing of shares and the payment of dividends and profits to someone who had inherited the estate of the person who owned 50% of this business. At the end of the day, the judge ruled in favor of the claimants and ruled that Alnando Corporation, Sudi Oscan, Crislin Moore, etc., were required to issue 50% of the shares in this business, this casino business, to Mr. Baker from the United States. And this is the Club Princess Casino. I can't answer that question, Madam Speaker, through you. But, but what I do know is that this casino business, which was owned by two people, was the subject of a dispute over how they would share the profits <laughs> from this casino business, which is Club something. Princess in Trinidad and Tobago. So I can't see how you could have a court action with the cause of action being that the other owner of the business was depriving the first owner of dividends and profits from this business that two of them owned, that going on in Trinidad and Tobago and a judgment delivered in 2017. And I read in this ad that telling me. Oh, but it will be respect to display, please. What's that? Display. 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 I'm not supposed to display anything. No. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I am terribly sorry, Madam Speaker. <laughs> was not aware. What you have here is this advertisement from the Trinidad and Tobago Members Club Association, published in the daily newspapers. So you have this advertisement here telling you that they have no owners. They have no owners. They have no casino and they have no owners. We have this judgment where two owners of a casino, a big one in Trinidad and Tobago. I think they have um, one in Movie Town. I think they have one in Chaguanas. I think they have one in San Fernando, this Club Princess. One, it's a big one. <laughs> so why is, the, why is the judge talking about the argument between the two owners of the Club Princess Casino in Port of Spain? Why are you defending it? Why are you defending it? Madam Speaker, the, the member for Naparima is speaking to me sotto voce across the floor. But it is referred to as the Princess Casino Stroke Members Club. <laughs> so now you know. <laughs> okay? So all of these stories that you hear out today are just preposterous. I mean, if one roulette machine is generating $500,000 in profit, they're not going to send them any workers. I just talk. That's, That's just an attempt workers. to terrorize they people. And, terrorize. In it, and if they do it, it's just pure wickedness. Okay. And they will have to hire them back. Because if the so machine's earning $500,000 or 100000 
The machine can't work on its own, you know, Madam Speaker. These are not robotic devices, you know. They have to have somebody there operating the roulette table, and that is where all the money is generated, I'm told, is on the roulette table. The slot machines and these other things, they generate some revenue, but nowhere close to the roulette table, where as much as 12 people sit down, and you have uh, a winning number being um, announced every 20 seconds. Unbelievable, as I understand it, is, is some kind of uh, exponential playway that somebody told me this is what this thing is like. Some kind of super playway, playway on steroids, because every 20 seconds you're getting a number. That's what I'm told. I, I don't know anything about it. What I do know, Madam Speaker, though, is that gambling is addictive. And I would just like to put into the record an article written by Natasha Skoll, who is a cultural anthropologist and associate professor in the program in science, technology, and society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is the author of Addiction by Design, Machine Gambling in Las Vegas, Princeton University Press 2012. And uh, just a few little things here. She says slots are commonly misperceived as an innocuous form of gambling because they offer relatively low stakes, are easy to play, and have been popular among women and retirees, and outwardly resemble youth video games. In fact, the opposite is true. Studies by a Brown University psychiatrist, Robert Breen, have found that individuals who regularly play modern video slots become addicted three to four times faster in one year versus three and a half years than those who participate in traditional forms of gambling like cards or sports betting. Breen calls these machines the most violent strain of gambling in the history of man. As I learned from interviews with hundreds of gambling addicts and game designers over nearly two decades of fieldwork on the US gambling industry, the particular addictiveness of modern slot machines has to do with the solitary, rapid, continuous wagering they enable. It is possible to complete a game every three to four seconds with virtually no delay between one game and the next. To my surprise, the vast majority of those I interviewed harbored no illusions of winning big. Instead of playing for the jackpot, they played for what some call the, the zone, a trance-like state of absorption that can suspend the pressures and anxieties of everyday life. Some players become so caught up in the interaction with the gambling machine that their awareness of space, time, and money fades. The consistency of the experience that's described by my patients is that of numbness or escape. Robert Hunter, clinical director of Problem Gambling Center in Las Vegas, told me in an interview. They don't talk about competition or excitement. They talk about climbing into the screen and getting lost. And that's just a little extract, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, we have think it's necessary to regulate this industry, but in the interim, uh, while the gambling control bill makes its way through the parliament, we, we believe that the people of Trinidad and Tobago, the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago, should get their fair share of this $15 billion industry. Let me move on now to other aspects of the order. Madam Speaker, in 2015, a suite of policy initiatives were put in place regarding the purchase of vehicles. The purpose of the initiatives was geared towards encouraging the population to switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources, thereby reducing Trinidad's and Tobago's carbon footprint. Exemptions were thus provided in respect of motor vehicles in terms of the MVT, the value at, yeah, sure. Value added tax and customs duty for electric vehicles with engine sizes less than 179 kilowatts and for hybrid vehicles with engine sizes less than 1999 cc's. Incentives were also put in place to facilitate a shift towards the use of compressed natural gas, or CNG, as it is also known. The initiatives at the time 
also included a 50% increase in taxes and duties on luxury vehicles. And that was defined as vehicles exceeding 1999 cc's, but this was limited to passenger cars. Uh, passenger vehicles did not include taxis, goods vehicles, agricultural vehicles, buses, etc. Madam Speaker, this measure did not have the intended effect. Trinidadians and Tobagonians are very clever. And they started to import luxury hybrid vehicles. So you began to see Mercedes-Benz and BMW with 1990 cc's as hybrids coming in. We, e we have estimated, Madam Speaker, we have estimated that the revenue foregone just in 2017 alone on these luxury hybrids, BMW hybrid, is of the order of $250 million. No, that's not a hybrid. So, Madam Speaker, we decided that this cannot be proper public policy. The intention never was to allow the importation of luxury vehicles tax-free and duty-free. So we have now reduced the size, the engine size, of hybrids and CNG vehicles that will qualify for exemption to 1599 cc's, a 1.6 liter engine. And this is spelt out in the order, in the various paragraphs in the order. So now, if you want to bring in a hybrid, it must be 1599 cc's or below in order to enjoy a waiver of taxes. And similarly, with a CNG-powered vehicle, Madam Speaker. And we believe that that would be more consistent with proper public policy. With respect to tires, we found, as I indicated in the budget speech, that a loophole was allowing persons to bring in tires and classify them as used tires when, in fact, they were new, and thus avoid duty. So they were classified as used, but they were, in fact, brand new tires. The duty on a used tire was 5%. The duty on a, a new tire was 30%. So we've harmonized the duty on tires to 30% to avoid that kind of tax evasion. Madam Speaker, we also have removed all the taxes on motorcycles, 300 cc's and below, to encourage the use of this form of transportation to make it more affordable, to encourage fuel-efficient vehicles, Madam Speaker. And Yes, I did, I did hear about that, and of course we can do that. So, Madam Speaker, the measures in the order are essentially an increase in gambling and gaming taxes, a reclassification of hybrid and CNG vehicles to make them vehicles 1.6 liters or below, and harmonization of the taxes on tires, and a, re a removal of taxes on motorcycles, 300 cc's and below. This is all part of our revenue raising for the 2018 budget, and we also see it as part of our public policy initiatives. I beg to move, Madam Speaker. Honorable members, I will now propose the question for debate. Be it resolved that the provisional collection of taxes order 2017 be confirmed subject to the following modifications in paragraph 5F. A, by deleting subparagraphs, Roman numeral three, and Roman numeral X, and B, by renumbering subparagraphs, Roman numeral four, Roman numeral five, Roman numeral six, Roman numeral seven, Roman numeral eight, Roman numeral nine, and Roman numeral 11, as subparagraphs, Roman numeral three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, respectively. Member for Orupuchis. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to join this debate on the government motion before us, which seeks to effect measures already passed in this House via the appropriation bill. Madam Speaker, it is my intention to respond briefly to some of the issues raised by the Minister, but to speak to the order which indeed spells out the effect of the change 
being initiated by the minister via a motion in the House. And the minister has already read in its entirety the motion, so there's no need to read this motion again, only to indicate that there are serious concerns about the issue of timing. And the minister indicated that these, these matters involving timing and the publication of the order and the timetable for debating the order and the, via the motion are uh, issues that arise because of the changing nature of the timetable of the debate of the appropriation bill and the subsequent uh, discussion in committee for the finance committee, standing finance committee. That has a serious implication in this matter, and I'll also come to that in a bit. Madam Speaker, the matter also involved the taxes on motor vehicles and a suite of changes that will be proposed by way of um, increasing costs in some cases on vulnerable groups that access vehicles. But to raise a few issues, first by way of introduction, Madam Speaker, there can be no doubt that the gaming sector has become one of the key drivers internationally of revenue, employment, investment. It has been a key area for real estate development across the globe. Apart from, by definition, certain Middle Eastern territories, by definition, across the entire globe, you can, you can actually see, there have been an expansion of this sector to the extent that several countries throughout the world and several regions have been taking steps over the last two decades or so to bring regularization, to bring a legal framework to control this sector, but also to ensure that they generate revenue from the sector. Uh, Madam Speaker, there's also a, a concurrent policy challenge here, and this is that this area is also an area that has a certain emphasis as well in social policy, because there are serious, there are serious concerns in this area about social policy issues and indeed public health issues. They arise here. This is why the area is a bit more complicated as a new development area than let's say the maritime sector or the, the IT sector by itself. This transcends legal issues, it transcends financial and fiscal issues, it transcends social policy and public health policy. So it is a very complicated area. But what do we know of the area? What we know of the area is that we don't know enough of the area. That's what we know. Because, Madam Speaker, we do not have an extensive amount of literature and policy documents on this area. And we have a few reports which I will touch in terms of regularization and taxation and so on. But I took note that the minister stated in his presentation, Madam Speaker, he confessed that, look, I don't frequent bars, I don't use these machines, I don't know nothing about this. Everything I told you today is what I hear from somebody. So that is his disadvantage, that he doesn't frequent bars or understand the machines working. I would think that in some development context, a minister would probably want to familiarize himself with an area for which he has such a great concern with in revenue generation, as indicated that it generates $15 billion in revenue. Now, unless I'm mistaken, that's probably more than the, the oil industry. That's probably more than the flagship state enterprise in the oil sector. And they generate profits, monster profits which is clearly more than the energy sector. So I would think that the minister would have told us that I took the, over the last two years the opportunity with a team to meet and interact with the stakeholders. And I did visit this place, and I did visit that place, and I did have the opportunity to see 12 people playing every 20 seconds. I would have thought he would do that, but the minister told us, I don't know anything about this. I don't frequent bars. I don't, 
And Madam Speaker, when you read the list of these taxes here that are being imposed, this is not the work of a sober man. <laughs> this cannot be the work of a sober person. But the minister has told us, well, look, I don't know about these things. I, I get my information. And that's the first concern we have. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's the very first concern. You would have thought that a government coming into this situation here would have commissioned some study either from the policy point of view through the ministry or even from the University of the West Indies or University of UT or UTT if you're not closing it down. Because they commissioned, I think, to rewrite the history of the Caribbean or Trinidad and Tobago. You could have commissioned through the Ministry of Finance yeah, no, no policy-related research that when you come to Parliament, you could say, yes, Correct. these five persons have done a, a research Correct. project. This is what they tell us, and in the absence of any other research, we have to go by that. Yeah, by so case. there is no research. No, there is no domestic um, uh, generation of policy documents. There is no domestic report on even financial issues. The minister made a fascinating admission. He said, look, in this country today, and he gave us the figure, he said there are 221 member clubs of which I think Queen's Park Oval is one. Queen's Park. And Harvard Club are, are one. Yeah. You're right. So there are 223 member clubs, of which he doesn't tell us how much involved gaming and gambling. Huh? Because the members club could be the, the Harvard club that play tennis and cricket and so on. 221 members club, but we have 686 bars and recreation clubs, according to the BIR. But then told us the FIU, Financial Intelligence Unit, has 97 private clubs. Mr. Minister, you are to blame. They all fall under the Ministry of Finance. You are to blame. This is the Ministry of Finance, FIU, BIR. What have you done in the last two years to suggest to us today that I am working to track down these missing entities? I am working to get them under the coverage of FIU so that they, so because the implication is very clear. The minister is, it has an implication there. They, they are escaping FIU, which means there's something dastardly there. Read money laundering and other criminal activities. But it is your job to ensure that these recreation clubs that involve in gaming find themselves properly under the financial intelligence unit, which is also under your purview. So, Madam Speaker, the government ought to have done this by way of some proper research in Trinidad and Tobago before coming to the House and just shouting out numbers at the top of their head. This is policy by VAPS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You come to the you come to the table, I'm going to say you come to the table, but you come to the house and you shout out information, 15 billion here, 500 on a machine here, two people working on this machine, but every 20 seconds they take a chance. <laughs> but who told you that? The Prime Minister once tell us he was on a boat and somebody tell him something about the port and he made public policy. You need to be informed by proper documentation and proper research. And empirical data. Madam Speaker, I'll be drawing from a, a report in my hand, which I will just say because I intend to depend on it. The Global Regulation, regulation of Gambling, a General Overview by Jane Nicolin from the University of Helsinki, and it is a 2014 document. It is a global report um, that I will want to draw from. So we have a report. We also have a report from Ireland as well, Madam Speaker, which I'll also use, Economic Assessment of a Regulated Casino Gaming Sector. There are reports available, and I imagine when I looked at the global report, Madam Speaker, do you know almost 50, no, well, no, about 25 pages is the bibliography. So you have a, a lot of material here. But in Trinidad and Tobago, we don't have material. And the minister, who admits that he knows nothing about the area, he has never been a participant and so on, comes here and just call figures, call numbers, call people name, call this one, call that one. And it is a wrong way to go about dealing with the sector. Yes. Madam Speaker, the... Yeah, Madam Speaker... What the minister didn't acknowledge is that the people in this sector, and I can begin by telling you that there is a particular club on Arapita Avenue, I think it's called Zanadu, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that. They have put up a notice on their board that they are closing December 1. That is a fact. 
So the club is closing. It is not a joke. It is, it is the fact. We're not guessing. They have been closing. And, Madam Speaker, I am told there are six establishments closing. 650 persons will be without a job come Christmas. That's a fact. There's a notice there. We, we, you know, we can get the notice and, and look at it and so on. But that's a fact. Now, if they are trying to, you know, you're suggesting that people are fooling employees and so on, they put up a sign that they're closing. They're gone. And this is an emotional area now. Madam Speaker, there were persons who came in from the parliament during the budget debate. I think on Diwali evening, they marched to the prime minister's private residence without sweets, I think. They came to him on a public holiday, I thought it was Diwali, that they visited him at his pri uh, private residence. Unless I'm mistaken, two persons associated with this sector have been banned indefinitely from coming to the um, parliament because of a certain incident. So it is an emotional issue. I had the opportunity, Madam Speaker, to reflect on the contribution of a senator in the other place during the appropriation bill debate. And Madam Speaker, the kind of statements that were made there, an evil tax. And we had testimony from several employees in this sector. They have their names quoted. This, you see, and it is related as well. Taxation is one thing you want to tax. And this is called compensatory revenue generation. There are two types of revenue generation. Continuous, where you have PAYE and so on. Over years and decades, you collect tax from royalty. But you also have something called compensatory taxing, which is because of your economic decline, you want to grab everything you see. Any sector that appears to be making money, you grab it. It is, a, it is an approach, compensatory revenue generation, where anything you see, I tax you. So you see anybody gathered together doing something and generating revenue, I tax you. So clearly the gaming sector is one ripe. So the minister is really trying to reach with his, with his stature. He's trying to reach up and grab some revenue from the gaming sector because he believes that is a lucrative area. And he believes that people are making money there, and they ought not to, and we need to grab taxation from them. But it is not properly conceived. And there's a betrayal of the workers in this sector by putting taxes like this on the table. There's a serious betrayal. This matter has engaged governments, many governments before, including the People's Partnership. We brought a bill to Parliament that deal with the regular, re regularization of the sector, involving issues of taxation of social policy, of a fund to assist with what is called problem gambling. Because we recognize that this issue is, there's a serious concern with problem gambling, where persons, it, is, it, it can lead to domestic uh, violence and abuse at the home, in the society, and so on. It is something we all recognize. This debate is not about if you support gambling or not, you know. This is not about it at all. This is how do you work with a 9,000 people sector to manage the, manage the regularization of the sector with absolutely no significant job loss, but also collect revenue and provide a social policy framework to deal with the problems, the social issues that emerge, and the public health issues that emerge. That's the issue. This is not whether you support gambling or not. And it, should not, it ought not to be used like one group of people evil um, and, uh, and have no moral scruples and have no religion and they support gambling. And the next one are pious and self-righteous. They don't support gambling. That's the most, Im almost moronic way of looking at it. But you see, Madam Speaker, while a joint select committee is in session, while the work has been saved and all parties are on the table discussing the regularization of this, the minister comes like a thief in the night and slap 100% tax on the gaming sector that has serious consequences for its survival. And the chairman of the committee, this is to act in, in bad faith. This is to undermine the work of a parliamentary committee. This is to destroy public trust in the work of that committee and its eventual report. How will you expect people to support you in a, in a joint select committee when you pull the rug from under their feet by saying, listen, you all continue to talk about gaming and regularization. We pass an attack on this, huh?
We come in. What is the use? What is the purpose? And that gaming bill is very important for another critical matter that the government has on the horizon, which is their blacklist, gray list, whatever list that they find themselves on. That is a serious matter. So undermining the trust and destroying the confidence of that sector in the gaming um, bill is a serious problem that the government has put themselves in. Very serious. Madam Speaker, the, the issues concern taxation. I think it's 100%. And just for the record, I have the differences. If I'm just to use, Madam Speaker, about um, two or three examples, I don't want to spend all the time just calling the name of table and, and that type of thing, um, Madam Speaker. The, to use a couple examples, uh, Madam Speaker, the blackjack table from $60,000 to $120,000, the dice table from 35,000 to 70,000, the electronic roulette machine, Madam Speaker, I think he has already, the minister indicated that is another 100% increase. Um, the, the slot machines as well, I think that, that has also gone up um, in terms of the, from 12,000 to 24,000. Amusement machines and bars, the license that, that covers that and the charge from 3,000 to 6,000. So we are, we are in agreement that you have an increase in 100%. But they are not taxing revenue. They are taxing machines. They are taxing machines, not revenue. There is no point here. So what you do is every time you see a machine, you say, I tax that machine. I don't care how much you raise from it. Because somebody told me every 20 seconds, 12 people put a bet. Somebody told me that. I don't know myself. I never went and see it. That, no, the minister says he never went and see it. I, I have been there. I see it. You know, I see it. I haven't seen the 20 second, but I was concentrating more on the $2 and $1 business. Madam Speaker, the minister cannot in a real parliament, in a serious place, say, I tax table because somebody tell me every 20 seconds they take a bet. This is, this is, I mean, I don't know what level of madness is this. And put in 100% on a machine, not revenue. Now, the minister, if he only wanted to be like a thief in the night, if, if that is your nature and you cannot help it, then what you can do is put a regime in place that attempts to monitor, to monitor the payment, the revenues that are generated from machine one to the next, and say, listen, we tax you 25% now on the revenues to be derived from X machine or ABC machine. It would have been a more useful approach and ensure com compliance. But you know what is the fundamental problem here? This government and this minister cannot even have compliance with the existing tax regime. They have a 10% compliance with the existing tax regime and now want to throw another tax regime. So, Madam Speaker, the first offense here is that you are taxing machines. You are not taxing revenue. And if the... So, what, what will happen here is that they will get rid of machines. Because you also put, I understand, a, a tax on the importation of machines from 20% to 40%. So, you get rid of them. You get rid of machines, and by definition, workers are associated with the machines. The minister stand up in parliament today. He told us, he said, no, one of these machines, they have two people working there. Somebody told him because he has never seen the place. He never went there. Somebody tell him to. Madam Speaker, when you go into some of these places, you have two people working on shifts. So another two come, another two come. And then you have supporting staff. Layers of staff. Layers of staff, whether they be waiters or bartenders or caterers or whatever. Supporting staff because of the number of people coming in. It is not just a question of two people manning a machine. Because somebody told you that. There's no empirical data. When will we reach a point where we can have empirical data upon which to make public policy? So, so tax the machines, man. Go down. And the effect of that is six establishments closed down by Christmas. Over six to 700 people out of a job for Christmas at this time. And who are these people? They are your own constituents. 
They're your own constituents. In some cases, they're your own voters that you trample and stampede upon who will be without work. Let me tell you something. This is not Karen 1975 Limited. You're closing down, you know. This is not that at all. And, and this is why today, Madam Speaker, regrettably, workers went to the home of the minister. They had to call police. I understand that the ministers in the Ministry of Finance and others need to have police patrol by their home. It have a minister. We don't know if they're living in the east or the west, but they have police by their house. So when you expect police to be patrolling areas and high crime area, they have to protect ministers at their home. Because you, you cannot consult or engage or have a participative environment to make change with people. You see, Madam Speaker, the, the minister also made a few other comments relative to this. And at the heart of this is another issue which I want to come to. This is a country now, and this debate and this measure has a policy, um, a policy direction linked here. The measure has a policy direction. It is an attempt to tax people because you believe that they make plenty of money and they're rich. At a meeting in San Fernando some time ago, no lesser person than the Prime Minister called the name of an owner, a, a key player in this industry, and said this person had to um, offer to help bail out Donald Trump and the person rich. And look at the people, they don't want to pay tax. So the member for Diego Martin West walked around with 43 bodyguard and then, put, then exposed another citizen of this country to criminal activity. That is what happened here. But it is an attempt to portray people as filthy and disgustingly and illegally rich. So we must go for them. Madam Speaker, you cannot have employees unless you have employers. You cannot have workers unless you have managers. You cannot have anybody. You cannot create employment. Now, the minister looks at this sector. And we talk so much about diversification. As one speaker said on a Monday night forum, we're talking about diversification since Adam was a little boy. This is an area that the minister should have looked at to see how can we work with this sector to create more jobs, to generate more revenue, to create more business. In, in, this, in this global report I'm quoting from, do you know, Madam Speaker, in some states in the United States, they are creating now casino operations on boats in the river, in the Mississippi or somewhere, because they believe that that is another area to develop. Gaming industry on the river, on the seas. And you link, you link that to employment generation. Do you know how much caterers operate? How much people are employed? How much police and private security are employed? How much, how much car park attendants? You know, how much car park attendants are recruited for this sector? But what you do, you say, they're getting plenty of money, we tax them. Tax them. And you close down, it's tax, tax, tax. And you close them down. And the very people you're trying to govern for are unemployed. That is the effect of this. They talk about 9,000 people in this sector. They have a direct, indirect support staff in this sector of about 30,000 employees. About 30,000. You affect all of them because you're, uh, you want to tax, tax, tax. And that... I think is, is almost criminal. Mm -hmm. What in your measure today, if I may ask the minister, you gave us your motion, your or, motion and then your order. Name one item in this order, one item in your motion that will lead to job creation in this sector. <laughs> Name one. Name one that will lead to generating more revenue. And the private bars, Madam Speaker, I too have complaints about this matter in my own constituency. All the bars, they have these machines. I went into one of these places in my constituency a couple of months ago. I didn't have a place to sit down. You had to stand up because there are only machines around. So I called the proprietor and I asked him, I said, tell me, what is happening here? You throw away all the table and chair, nobody could sit down here. He said, I want to tell you something. You have these machines, you earn some, some revenue, you share at the end of the month, and you have a stable revenue base at the end of the month. So it supplements, it supplements their sale of beverage or snacks and so on. And they make a living. They hire people to come in the evening and clean up, people to pick up bottles and so on. 
Today, you have increased by 100% their taxes on those machines in those bars and recreation clubs. So, they will say, look, that's too much to pay. Get rid of them, and you have more depression, more economic decline, particularly in rural areas. The effect of that is more delinquency, more abuse of drugs, more abuse of alcohol, more family-related domestic problems. Those are the consequences intended or not from your taxation. That is what it will, will lead to. This notion that people out there have so much and we could tax them all, it is wrong. And w there's, this sector is now has a modicum of organization because you have committees and unions and so on. All they are saying is to meet and treat with us. Meet and treat with us. You know what is remarkable and we discovered when we were in government? Every player in this sector tells us we want regularization. We want regulation. We demand a legal framework. Because there's also an illicit, illegal subsector, which you are not touching, incidentally. They operate, they operate opposite police station now. There's an illegal and illicit subsector. But you are taxing the legal sector, the sector that is already subject to taxation. The yeah. You get them into extinction, and then the illegal ones continue. Yeah. Or is this more of a dastardly plan so that foreigners can come in now? Who can afford this? Foreigners can come in here and start occupying the space. Start occupying the space that would be left available when six to 20 businesses go out of circulation. Is this part of it? Is it part of sandals, casino, and gaming sector as well? That you want to get rid of people? Because there's a real estate crisis as well. When these people close down their business, who's going to rent from the malls and the shopping centers and the, and the areas there? Who? So there's an all wrong economic decline involved. And Madam, Sec uh, Madam Speaker, the Minister of um, Finance with his technical team and so on could have taken a more holistic view of this. There are different approaches suggested, Madam Speaker, different approaches that deal with taxing and raising revenue from this sector. And the Minister, without knowing it, I don't know if he knows what he's saying is correct or not, just to add to him that in, in the state of Nevada, which he raised, and the state of Nevada is home to Las Vegas, so the state of Nevada, the state revenue generated in 2012 was 868 million United States dollars. State revenue. And Madam Speaker, you know what caught my attention in this global overview of the gaming sector? Do you know when countries embark upon this, this type of measure to tax? Not 100% tax to throw people out of business, but re reasonable taxation. And I repeat, the gaming sector, those in that sector, Madam Speaker, are saying clearly, we understand you have to tax. And we are prepared for that. Let us discuss that. And get to the point where government gets its revenue and the business continue. People have their jobs and so on. Do you know in the states in the United States and in other countries so defined, and Florida is, is clearly one, when they tax on gaming, the sector. They actually say in law where that money is to go to. It is to go to education. It is go to go to social welfare programs. It is to go to cultural and sporting activities. It is to go to this. The minister is telling us how much millions he will raise. Where will that money go to? So we agree with you today on this high-handed authoritarian approach. Where the money going? It will go for what? Upgrade the golf course? It will go for what? For paintings? It will go to, to do what? What is it? So that the, the minister, if he had any interest in being decent, would have come to the parliament and would have come today and said, Madam Speaker, I propose that 60%. Honorable Member for Urupuchi, your original speaking Good time is now spent. Yes. You're entitled to 15 more minutes if you intend to avail of you yes. can please proceed. So thank you, Madam Speaker. The minister, I'm saying, the minister could have come to the parliament today and, t and tell us that 80% of the revenue raised from taxation will go to local government. Children of 
or will go to the children's hospital, or will go to complete the Ramaitre school, or the school in Princess Town, will go to pay uh, some social welfare program to deal with addicts or addiction related to, to gambling, problem gambling. You could have told us that. But this money that you will, you will collect will go to what? It will not be linked to any specific program, any specific target. The minister will jump up later and say, well, this goes into the consolidated fund, and we'll pay wages with it, we'll pay for schools and health service and so on. In fact, there's a health issue that I was reading about this. Because when you have the problem gambling that lead to now addictive gambling, it creates now mental health issues. <coughs> and there's a greater demand upon the public health institutions and so on, if not managed properly. No. And they don't have drugs, Medicaid. and they don't have facilities in the hospital. So maybe 20% of the revenue raised here should go to the health sector for the provision of proper equipment and medication, which they don't have. But when you take it and you try to cream it off, throw it in the consolidated fund and say, listen, we're going to China to enjoy ourselves. Yeah. A trip coming up. We don't know what the meeting is about, and we don't know who else is going to this meeting. But we hear the head of government going. But they can't tell us who else is going and what they're going to discuss. World it's a fascinating leader. trip. World leaders are assembling. But we don't know who is the other world leader. Madam Speaker, where will the revenue go to? That is a critical issue that we want to put on the table. Where will it go to? Where will it go to cars? Will it go for the, where would the revenue go to increase the housing stock? Now that you have taken $20 million in housing stock to give to ministers and other officials, will it go to build low-cost housing, Madam Speaker? And the government admitted yesterday they broke the law when cabinet unilaterally altered a report from the Salaries Review Commission. Only parliament can change that, not cabinet. So, Madam Speaker, would the money go for low-cost housing? Would it go to house ministers and cronies at the ministries, OJTs? Where would the revenue go to? And they, they have three or four attorney general there, and they don't know that the cabinet cannot override the salary review commission report. They don't know that. Only pa and just to correct, because I know they, I, I'm, they can disturb me. In 2014, the People's Partnership altered a report from the Salary Review Commission in the Parliament on the 14th of March 2014 when we rejected a recommendation from the SRC. But Parliament had to do that. Parliament had to do that. A cabinet cannot change the terms and conditions of an office holder under the purview of the Salary Review Commission. They cannot. And that, that is a matter that will go elsewhere, I am sure. But Madam Speaker, I have touched on some of these issues on the betrayal of the government. And you know, the gaming sector is telling you, if you want to raise money, tell us. Online gaming, online gambling is a major area now. If you want to deal with the social policy issues, do you know, I am not suggesting, but do you know in some territories and states and countries, they actually say in certain areas they don't have locals going to, to gamble. So if you are so concerned with the social issue, as they pretend to be, you could look at a certain area and say, look, this area is for the tourists and tourist attraction in Tobago and in northwest of Trinidad, and you restrict locals from, from gambling. You could look at it, Madam Speaker, and say, look, there's an age. You adjust the age of people who have access to these clubs and so on. There are many, many policy interventions you could look at if you really had the social issues at heart. But you don't. You see M-O-N-E-Y, and you say, I want a piece of the action. Give me, give me, give me. I want tax, tax, tax. That is the approach. It is not social policy. Madam Speaker, and the member for Digo Martin Northeast, you know, he will get some more visits from those workers, I'm sure. Um, I, I, you know, I, it's regrettable that the, the visitors came to his home and so on. But I'm sure that they will, be, they will want to visit him at other locations that he frequents, that at other, okay, where he frequents. And the way they are going to lose their jobs and be impoverished and destitute, they may want to live in the Ford Mustang. They may want to live in the Ford Mustang as well. Number seven, 
they may want to seek number seven out and live there, you know? So, Madam Speaker, on the yacht, on the yacht, Madam Speaker, I just want to make a few comments on the cars and so on, on this matter, because other colleagues of mine, I'm sure, would have to speak and, and would speak on that. Madam Speaker, I want to indicate, which is public knowledge, and it ought to be, that it was the government of the People's Partnership that first took substantive policy initiatives to ensure that we reduce the dependency on fossil fuel in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, it was the Ministry of Energy in 2013, 2014, 2013, that had the whole idea of incentives for hybrids and electric cars as a focus of policy intervention. Today, Madam Speaker, the government has taken action which we believe will have some downside and some fallout in terms of affordability of vehicles to specific group of income categories. Madam Speaker, to remind you that it was the Trinidad and Tobago government under the People's Partnership that first outlined a comprehensive national framework, framework for climate change, Madam Speaker, that was, that was sent to the Paris, that, that was um, Trinidad and Tobago submits its climate action plan ahead, Madam Speaker, of the 2015 Paris Agreement. And when we did that, we had identified three key, key areas to reduce our dependency on fossil fuel and to reduce emissions from, of carbon dioxide. And they were industrial, power generation, and transport. And in the area of transport, we promoted the compressed natural gas uh, initiative. And I think this was introduced on buses as well when we were there, Madam Speaker. And uh, Madam Speaker, we have a proud record on that, on that issue. But we are informed, Madam Speaker, that as a result of these initiatives today, this has an impact because they have reduced the bandwidth where taxes and tax exemptions would be possible. And I don't want to get tied up here with 1943 and 1921 and 1763 and so on. I will use cars as an example because the cars are known and the car, people, everybody out there would have a sense of the engine power of the cars and so on. Madam Speaker, do you know for the poor man, a Serena or a Nova, these are used as taxi. So a poor man who is retrenched, who has no job, who wants to earn a little living with a taxi in his area, the cost, because they have moved the bandwidth and to, to go to 1999 CC now, they have increased it. A taxi car that you want to buy because you want to eke out a living because you lost your job in the ministry of this or ministry of that, the cost of that, Serena, will move from one, approximately $150,000 to $300,000 as a result of this. Madam Speaker, yeah, Madam Speaker, I am also told that a vehicle, for example, like the X-Trail SUV hybrid, that has become very popular with middle-income families and so on. And you know, we have now laws, and I must say good laws, that you have to put children and babies in their seats and so on. I support that a thousand percent. Right. Yeah. yeah. I support that, Madam Speaker. But when you have laws where you are now compelled, as you should be, to protect children and babies and so on, it requires you to have a different type of vehicle. This is a country that is ridden by crime. This is a country that is ridden by flood. You can't have low cars that are that one foot or 18 inches or something off the ground. You can't drive no in Trinidad with that. You can't drive no in Trinidad with these low cars because of flooding, because of crime. And the X-Trail SUV, for example, I give only, huh? Yeah. If you fall in a pothole, the car could disappear. These small cars, you know what they have done? They have increased the taxes now because the X-Trail SUV, which was a popular vehicle among the middle income range of people, particularly families, because you want to secure your children and your babies and so on, you have put a 25% increase on the X-Trail SUV. So instead of, I am told, instead of $205,000 for one, it goes to $290,000, $300,000 for one. So that that now is out of the reach 
of lower income people, middle income people. So there's this attack on all sides towards working people and middle income people. There's this all out onslaught. Pay more for tires. Pay more for the cars that are, were before affordable to you. Pay more tax in everything that we do. Because the Minister of Finance has a framework where anything he see. Listen, they will go into the bars where they're playing all fours. See these people playing all fours on a table and decide to tax every table playing all fours. You know? if, they, yeah, if you give them the chance, they will, they will do that. They will do that anywhere there's an activity. They will threaten doubles man, roti man, bacon shark, nuts man. When they realize that they may have a handful of one dollar bill, they will tax them. And this is the risk because you have no vision, you have no plan, you have no development focus. Madam Speaker, in the last two years as I wind up, if you can tell me one thing that they have built, I will tell you one thing that they have not destroyed. Hmm. Every sector, every area. They talk big about diversification. They talk big about that. Which area have you contributed to diversifying what? Where? Marijuana cultivation? What have you done in two years in any one sector to say it is now showing growth, more jobs, more revenue, more taxation, more investment? The Unicoma opened the other day. That is an investment that was done under the People's Partnership. Oh, you look at this country, all the malls, the hospitals, C3, C3 everything was done under the People's Partnership. Two things they tried when they got into office. They turned this out to build a car park in Port of Spain. I don't think they're parking cars yet. They turned this out. No, they didn't turn this out. They said they're doing a walkover and they beat them. Anybody see the walkover? They had a PPP for the housing project in St. Joseph. Officials of the government and the private contractor fight. And the PPP collapsed into a P. <laughs> Madam Speaker, in, Madam Speaker, that has collapsed as well. And while this is happening, the Minister of Finance comes to the House today and tells us, I don't know about this sector. I never went to a game in um, a, a casino. I never went into a bar. I don't frequent there. But somebody tell me that has happened. Somebody tell me every 20 seconds to have a gamble. And I working on that. $500,000 on a ruling machine they're making, I come in for that. Yeah. It is, it is he say, he say that he say. That is how they, they project public policy. And this, and this is why the Minister of Finance find himself with a private matter with $55 million to pay. This is why he find himself there. Because somebody tell him that somebody tell him that somebody tell him. And then the judge tell him to pay $55 million. So when you have an approach like this, you are bound to get yourself in trouble. Yeah. I'm asking the minister to reconsider this ill-conceived order because if it is not approved by the House, it will cease to be law. It is law, I believe. It will cease to be. Reconsider your ways. Atone for your sins. Repent. Speak. Depart from your sins. And let the casino workers with their soul and their heart and these poor people, many of whom are your constituents, let them impose upon you some decency, some heart, some love for this Christmas season. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Fernando West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it taxes every fiber of my being to listen to the contribution of Orupuch East on a continuous basis. And I'll tell you why, Madam Speaker. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why the I'll tell you why the, the exercise to conscience, the exercise to morality, the exercise to intelligence is such a difficult one for certain people. Madam Speaker, we're here to treat with a matter of law. The law that we're treating with today is the order before us to be dealt with by motion. It is as put out by the Minister of Finance, pursuant to Section 3 of the Provisional Te Collection of Taxes Act. That is, of course, law set into the books of Trinidad and Tobago by Act No. 1 of 1963. From 1963, we saw an amendment to that piece of law in 1977. And Section 3 of that Act says with clear detail 
that where proposals for general or supplementary appropriation of public funds are made to the House of Representatives and are embodied in, a, in an appropriation or supplementary appropriation bill, as the case may be, the President may, for the purpose of raising revenue to meet the expenditure specified in such bill by order, provide for the imposition of tax or the variation of any existing taxes and from the date of publication of the order in the Gazette or such later date as may be specified as the commencement of the order, the tax imposed or varied by the order shall be payable. That's what section three of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act sets out. It sets that out and has been the law since 1977, that particular provision. There's an expiry pursuant to section, subsection 3.5 of the same law where if you don't take the step for confirmation by the House of Representatives, it will in fact lapse. But then we hear Oropuch East come along. Oropuch East suggests to Trinidad and Tobago that there is something wrong with taxation in the fashion that this order seeks, that this motion seeks to approve. And if we were to accept a word of what Oropuch East says, then how do we explain the fact that he, as leader of government business, when he sat in the government of Trinidad and Tobago, participated in the same orders to do the same thing year on year. How does the honorable member suggest to this house that taxing the gaming industry, as he's put out, is something that cannot happen? The honorable member said that the minister of finance, who sits as the chairman of the joint select committee, to deal with the gaming legislation as we're now meeting, that he, it is wrong in his submission, as I understood it, for the taxation issue to come on the table now because that JSC is afoot. Imagine. Well, then if that is true, Imagine how that. on earth is it possible for the last government to have brought the gaming legislation as they did, and in every year of sitting, they dealt with the amendments to the law as this order seeks to do. Every year, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they came by way of order. They increased the taxes on Baccarat table, blackjack table, Caribbean stud poker table, dice table, poker table, roulette table, rum 32 table, the favorite one, sip sam table, slot machines, every year. And the rationale and the, and the foolishness of the approach offered by the honorable member for Orupuch East is to be found in the fact that taxation has nothing to do with the substantive amendments to regulate the gaming industry. The Honorable Member comes to the House today and says, this country needs data. Let us deal with data. This is a government that by VAPs, where is the data? He has the temerity, most respectfully, to say that when in five years and three months of government as he sat, not a scrap of data on the industry was managed. Today, the honorable member very flippantly says that the government gonna have to deal with its little blacklisting or gray listing. You know how he's comical in his submission, just making it up as he goes along, the honorable member does. But Mr. 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 Deputy Speaker, he touched upon two extremely important events which tie into the very point that I just made. And the point that I just made was that, one, there's an incongruity, and there is an, in fact, a mutually exclusive arrangement between taxation and substantive law. Number two, there is, in fact, data that the country has considered for several years. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when we talk about the little small marks of blacklist and gray list, as the Honorable Member put it out, the Honorable Member is referring to something which he ought to know well. Trinidad and Tobago has obligations in the gaming sector in particular to meet the requirements of our international entities which have rated us after review, and there are two of them in particular. The first one is the Financial Action Task Force, and the second one is the Global Forum. The Financial Action Task Force consists of 190 countries. 37 of them sit in the parent body, the Financial Action Task Force, and the balance of them sit across nine 
FSRBs, FATF style regional bodies. And those entities and countries, because they're entities from each country that sit at the table, finance intelligence unit, uh, the, the police force and the revenue collection authorities, the law enforcement agencies, ministers of national security, attorneys general, all sit in these events. And these countries have rated Trinidad and Tobago upon the tenure of the last government's performance. And the Financial Action Task Force completed its ratings of Trinidad and Tobago in something called the fourth round mutual evaluation based upon the work in January 2015. And as a result of that rating in January 2015, it was observed that the last government did absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing to improve the effectiveness and technical compliances of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm hearing the Honorable Member's Office say, what you do? And what you did in two years? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am able to say no, first of all. I must, I'm bound to correct another irresponsibility by Orofuch East. Can Naprima please just keep it quiet? It's an inability to control oneself when you engage the way you do, Honorable Member. Members, Thank you, Mr. Members. Deputy Speaker, for your protection. Member Funaprima, again, right? I haven't made mention of anything, but I've been taking note of it. Please, go ahead, Member. Thank you. One must learn to contain oneself. We sat down and listened quietly. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the... Yes, you had your opportunity. Let's proceed. Member for Honorable AG, kindly proceed. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Members asked Soto Voce across the floor, what have you done in two years relative to the remedy that is required to the absolute fiasco that was left by the last government in the Financial Action Task Force? I am very pleased to say that as confirmed by the Financial Action Task Force in the plenary held in Argentina last week, it ended. Trinidad and Tobago was observed to have made massive success, so recorded in writing by the Financial Action Task Force, to such point where they have removed us from the obligation to report to the ICRG grouping at FATF and referred half of that work to the Financial Action Task Force subbody, which is the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. Further, in their published post-observation period report, the government of Trinidad and Tobago came in for open complement by the international agency for the work conducted in the last two years, specifically in respect of the criminal justice reforms, the caseload and management that was undertaken, the levels of effectiveness demonstrated in the operationalization of the anti-terrorism laws, in the forfeiture, in the civil claims. Because we heard Oropoch East a little while ago say, perhaps the minister is inclined to being a thief in the night. I want to remind that they're thieves in the day. And thieves in the day have found themselves into the contemplation of our international agencies because they have looked with great interest at the work that the government of Trinidad and Tobago has done specifically in relation to anti-corruption, money laundering, bid rigging, and money laundering as a major context of what the FATF does. The member for Naparima has repeated across this floor on umpteen occasions as we've started that Trinidad and Tobago is gray listed. Oropochi said it. This is a fundamental ignorance demonstrated by members opposite. The fourth round mutual evaluation of the Financial Action Task Force has no gray listing. The gray listing only happens, gray listing, dark gray listing, and black listing under the third round mutual evaluation. And Trinidad and Tobago is only under enhanced follow-up where we are obliged to put certain mechanisms into effect. So I, I'm obliged to correct the record lest the irresponsible statements that Orofuch East is want to offer find themselves into the international media again. 
as his statement about there being, as it was reported, 400 um, FTF fighters, foreign terrorist fighters, found its way into umpteen newspaper reports abroad. That's where my friend from Port of Spain, North St. Anne's East, okay, yeah. says all the time that there's a need for patriotism and that we must be aware of people who are unpatriotic. The second matter that I'm obliged to correct coming out of a, a statement again made by Oropooch East in his flippant remark to blacklisting and graylisting or whatever it is, so unconcerned is the honorable member to actually find out what it is, it comes out as a flippancy, is the work under the Global Forum. And in fact, that's where the honorable member is perhaps even slightly closer to reality. Because it is the Global Forum that has put Trinidad and Tobago into the worst form of reflection by saying that of the 192 countries that comprise the 142 countries that comprise the Global Forum, Trinidad and Tobago is the only jurisdiction of 142 pooled jurisdictions to have not made significant advance with respect to the Global Forum and the common reporting standards. And again, that is squarely because of the lack of diligence or care or plan or operation by the last government. What happened to the two years? And I'll come to the two years. Because under the Global Forum, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's a fact that the last government in 2010 allowed us to go through peer review. In 2011, the last cabinet allowed us to be rated and then apply to the Global Forum. In 2014, the sole activity for the Global Forum was to send Minister Hawaii to Berlin in Germany to give a high-level commitment to say that we will be ready to operationalize the law by 2016. And you know the Global Forum in its review of Trinidad and Tobago ending at 2015, January 2015, under the last government said, you did absolutely nothing. You had an obligation to put into law 13 intergovernmental agreements of the type that we had with FATCA, and you didn't do it. You had an obligation to deal with double taxation and amendments to inland revenue, and you didn't do it. And what was fortunately well retrieved by a combined effort between the Ministry of Finance and the Office of the Attorney General was Trinidad and Tobago's ability to be taken seriously, both at FATF and at the Global Forum, because specifically with respect to the Global Forum, we applied for fast tracking. We applied for a deferral of obligations until 2018. We have the ability to enter into a multilateral convention, which will obviate the need for 13 um, intergovernmental agreements to be done. And fortunately, we have received communication in writing from the Global Forum saying, and has published in their report, that Trinidad and Tobago is taking active steps. So thank God that we have a diligent Minister of Finance working to an agenda to accomplish the work that the last government refused to do and that the Office of the Attorney General is right alongside it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in speaking to the need for this order to be affirmed by way of this motion and in dealing with the content and rationale of Section 3 of the Provisional, of Collec Pro Provisional Collection of Taxes Act, it is clear that Oropooch East continues to make it up as he goes along. The appropriation bill which anchors the law in Section 3 of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act, which is what this motion is about, says that these provisional taxes are applied to statements in the budget, in the appropriation bill. The Honorable Member rolls out and says, let's talk about the poor man. I don't know how the Honorable Member even vaguely remembers the poor man bearing in mind the, 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 the matters that we are dealing with. But the fact is, in the appropriation bill, in the speech of the Honorable Member for Dago Martin Northeast, the Minister of Finance, the Honorable Member is now proved to be completely inaccurate, and I'm being polite when I say that, because he stood up here and flippantly told the Honorable Members of this House that the poor man and the maxi-taxi and the, the, the fellows who now unemployed and want to run a little taxi, all of them cars going up, and I'm not going to call out CC and all kind of thing. I'm going to call out the maker of the car. That's what the Honorable Member said. Listen to page 10 of the budget contribution of the Honorable Member for Diego Martin Northeast. Madam Speaker, I would have to mention 
in this House previously that in some respects the measures put in place have had the desired effect of increasing the supply of fuel efficiency and clean energy vehicles. There arose, however, an unintended consequence whereby individuals took advantage of the tax waiver on hybrids to import luxury vehicles at the engine size lower than 1999 cc's. This has caused a significant leakage of tax revenue. Further, notwithstanding our current financial challenges as a country, the importation of motor vehicles has remained unabated, with 35,000 vehicles imported in 2017, the same amount or marginally less in 2016. It should be noted that the country has effectively lost $500 million in foreign exchange in 2017 alone. And the Honorable Member specifically says that is there was an increase in MVT and customs Thank duties you. on vehicles exceeding 1999 cc's, and listen to this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but did not include taxis, maxi taxis, good vehicles, agricultural vehicles, private school buses, and vehicles used for public purposes. So how do we take Oropuchi seriously? Taxi. Out of his mouth flippantly and in his by usual the, comedy, glibly talking, he says, the, the taxi man will suffer and transportation will suffer. The law does not apply to taxis, maxi taxis, public vehicles. They are for private vehicles only. And you know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what annoys me about the member for Digum, about the member for Silence. Police. What annoys me about the Honorable Member is that he just makes it up as he goes along. Could not be bothered to read the very order, which is the subject of the motion on this Parliament, which clearly sets out, if you do your homework, that you're not talking about taxis and maxi-taxis and public transportation. The Honorable Member then goes on to talk about the Paris Convention, or what the last government did, etc., absolutely sure about nothing because the Paris Convention is speaking to reducing the carbon footprint for the country and which the Honorable Member for Naprima is now blurting out and which you all haven't ratified. Well, before you ratify something, you have to check the cost and you have to check the logistics. And I want to put onto the table now the cost of managing the implementation, which will be done for the Paris Convention has been measured at close to 200 million, two billion, two US. billion US dollars. Two billion US dollars. Two billion US dollars. And whilst the country is committed, having dealt with the treaty, whilst the country is committed to doing this, the fact is you have to make sure that you don't end up in an era of ways which will cause a catastrophe in your country because you must check the material and the cost first. Because when you implement a treaty such as this, is it that Point Lisa's industrial estate is automatically going to have to comply? Who pays the cost? Is it the government? Is it not? It's the same way, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the honorable members opposite put us into the very situation that we're in right now. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you will hear on the airwaves, you will see on the streets, people crying to be paid their salaries. Salaries have been paid late because money was not available for the payment of salaries. That's no laughing matter. What caused us to be in that position is very relevant to this debate. What caused us to be into this position is that our contribution of revenue from our oil and gas sector by way of corporation taxes, usually stands at 33.6% of our GDP. But as a result of decisions taken by the last government, we have dropped into silence. We have dropped into the last two years where receipts have fallen to 1.3%. And therefore, this particular government has the obligation, as it is doing, to find revenue by way of borrowings, by way of bonds, and by way of increased collection of taxation. And it is in this, Mr. Siparia, help me out now. A little quiet now. Mr. Deputy members, Speaker. Members, members.
Members, members, member for Naparima, you, hold on, I'm, speak, I'm on my legs. You continued to make some chatter. I'm hearing you, right? And member for Separia, yes. you are very close to him, so please ensure that he simmers down. Go ahead. Thank you. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, when your revenue falls to such a catastrophic basis because the last government could not understand the need to put a cap upon the continued carryover of losses which the oil and gas companies are in fact carrying over, what happens is you turn to taxation. And in levying the taxation as it relates to the gaming sector in particular, which the last government did every single year in appropriation bills, as this government has done, and in causing the increase as we have done by 100% in certain of the activities, what we are doing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is ensuring that we actually have money to pay wages. And whilst the honorable members opposite may not be interested in where the money comes from, this government has an obligation to make sure that people can feed their families. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, I declare openly that I did significant work for the gaming sector when I was in private, private practice. I am properly aware of how they organize themselves. Under the registration Member, of clubs. Hold on. Member for Urupuch East. I'm hearing you. I am hearing you. I'm no, hearing you. Rudian. Disgusting. Members, members. Proceed, AG. Honorable AG. Mr. Deputy Speaker, under the Registration of Clubs Act, the last government anchored into law in 2014, some very important provisions which give life to the very aspect of taxation that they're complaining about right now. It was in 2014 that the last government came to the House and specifically introduced into law sections 23A, 23B, 23C, amendments to 23 and amendments to 25 of that law. And that law is law which we're amending today in terms of consequential amendments in the motion. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me explain what I mean. A private member's club is defined in law. It's under the Registration of Clubs Act. That's Chapter 2101. A member's club means a club not constituted for the acquisition of gain, hmm. the members of which contribute to the funds out of which the expenses of conducting the club are paid, and are jointly entitled to all the property and funds of the club. That's what a member's club is in law. To carry out gambling, as is done in a member's club, every gambler has to become a member. Because the law says if you're not a member, or if you frequent it in terms of membership more than four times, and you don't have seven days in between your, your visitor with a member rule, that you could shut down the club. So the persons that go to casinos become members. According to the law, all of the members are entitled to all share in the profit of the club. Big joke. All. But the last government put into law, in the context of the law, and in particular, I want to refer you to it, that not only must we have licenses issued every uh, 15th of January of every year, etc., but that persons can't become honorary members. You can't frequent it as a visitor. There must be gaps in the law. People who are habitually admitted as members without intervals of at least seven days between nomination and admission are in trouble. But they go on, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to say that there is to be taxation, section 23. Subject to this section, there shall, commencing be charged on all gambling tables, and this was amended in 2014, and all other gambling devices used or to be used on the premises of a member's club desiring to carry on gambling activities therein, a tax to be known as the gaming tax at the rate specified in the schedule. And it is that schedule which we're amending. So whilst Oropochi stands up and somehow inexplicably says, you can't tax while you have to develop the law, they introduced a law in 2015 
on the last day that Parliament was going to sit, passed it in the House of Representatives, came up to the Senate. They were doing the law, and there it is, right there in the black and white amendments to the Act in 2014, and again in 2015, where they are saying they're introducing a tax. And it's in the law. They put it in the law. So how does one make sense of the utter nonsense that Oropuchi is puts out? Make it up as you go along, frighten people, telling the minister how his constituents come outside his house. When there are videos circulating of the same people who came outside the Honorable Minister's house in yellow emblazoned jerseys marked UNC, holding placard with Devant Shaking Maraj shaking the leader of the opposition's hand as she was prime minister then. Balling, we support the UNC and then coming outside the minister house to say, well, we vote for you. Come on, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, come on. Made no better opposition than the incredible submissions by Orupuch East, the original make it up as you go person in this house. And I make no apology for saying that. That's not improper motives, that's recognizing a lack of ignorance and intelligence on submissions of the law, on submissions of the law. Overruled, member, address the chair. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it goes further. The honorable members, listen to what they put in again. Again, the law amended it by Act Number 4 of 2014. For the purposes of this section, this subsection 10 of 23B, a gambling transaction means a transaction where a payment is made in money or money's worth to or by a member's club, whether or not the purpose of the transaction is for payment, issue, or redemption of money's worth or for gambling. And they go further, notwithstanding any rule of law to the contrary, but subject to subsection 3, an action shall lie for recovery of any amount claimed in respect of gambling transactions conducted at member's club. So they, they have the taxation. They broaden the taxation in the last government. They make sure that you can actually sue for gambling, which you're not supposed to do in breach of the law, because you can't not share any profit as a member. And to be allowed to gamble, you have to be a member or a visitor on limited occasions. So they deepen the law. They create the tax. They amend the Liquor Licensing Act. They amend the Registration of Clubs Act. And then they come to this house and say, well, look, you can't tax. Taxation is wrong. You have to have the law first. Let's deal with the regulation in the law. And, you know, and, 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 and Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you listen to those submissions against the actual comparators of law when offered when they were in government and as now they stand in opposition, it is just say anything, make it up, and oppose for the sake of opposition. That's all that it is. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is in fact an excellent paper which comes from Casino Enterprise Management Law. It's a publication in October 2010. It's an article by Glenn Light and Carl Rutledge. It's entitled Gaming Policy Models Part 4, Taxation of Gambling Revenue. And as the Minister of Finance reflected upon regimes in the United States, etc., in Pennsylvania, again, tax revenue is at 55%. And the merits of having a taxation for the purposes of revenue generation are set out. Because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let us explain why this particular position of taxation is one that can be borne. Number one, the fact is that the members' clubs, operating as private members' clubs but really as casinos, have been recognized to be that. Number two, the position is that they earn significant amount of revenue when the Honorable Minister of Finance is talking about throughput, revenue throughput versus profit are two different things. And when you have 200 plus entities, you have to make sure that you're actually causing the regulation. I want to tell the Honorable Members opposite. The incongruity between the Board of Inland Revenue's numbers, which is in the 200s, and the FIU's registration, which is now up to 100, because the FIU has actually caused um, their analysis as at November 2016 to be known, and their statistics demonstrate one gaming house. Member, your original time has expired. You have an additional 15. Care to avail yourself? Yes, sir. Proceed.
So the FIU statistics as of November 2016 demonstrate gaming house one, pool betting, 13 establishments. National Lotteries Control Board, there's one of them. Private members clubs, 86, total 101. But the casino style operators, as they put it, at 200. By raising the bar on taxation from entities that are well healed, where, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am able to say with certainty the return on investment for a casino is 12 months. Let me explain that. If you take your investment, you decide you want to open a casino, you get an establishment, you outfit it, you hire people, you buy all the devices, you pay your taxes to start up, you get your licensing, etc. The time frame to get back the money that you put out is approximately 12 months. There is nowhere else in this economy that the return on investment is 12 months. And therefore, in an environment where there is money laundering, in an environment where there is a potential for criminality, as proven by cases in law, and I just need to refer to one case in law, which actually happened by way of a guilty plea in the United States of America. It was the United States government versus one David Migliori. And in that particular case, there was an admission of guilt, $1.286 million US in taxation by way of evasion was paid over, and the gentleman spent 46 months in jail in the United States. But his earnings were as a result of Trinidad and Tobago private members clubs, where monies were paid into shell companies in the United States of America, and there were proceeds of cash everywhere. That's one case in one country in the United States of America on money made in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm. And when you're dealing with 12 months to make back your money, the workers need to understand the need to tell their employers that they know that they can pay the positions that are being offered by way of increasing taxation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is a serious criminality in the unlawful roulette gaming in Trinidad and Tobago. We are talking about issues of alleged murder. We are talking about threats, harassment. We are talking about significant criminality. These matters are under investigation as I speak, and therefore I can't go too deep into them. But in our obligation to regulate this industry, the Honorable Minister of Finance has done a very important thing. He has secured a building, he has secured bodies, he has secured an army of personnel to check establishment by establishment on the foot and ground in Trinidad and Tobago as we go through the exercise of investigating every property in Trinidad and Tobago. And in dealing with that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what happens is you will identify the casinos, the amusement bars, the positions, and therefore the reporting back into the new and improved structures of government means that you will enforce the law. When you enforce the law, you tie in, as we are intent upon tying in, to our campaign, which will meet this parliament shortly, of dealing with white collar crime, and dealing with follow the money, and dealing with it not as we are doing only in relation to litigation which is afoot against known criminals in this country or persons who have breached certain laws in this country because there's criminality and civil, not only in respect of persons like that who are known, but also in terms of legislation as we deal with legislation. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, this motion before us therefore ties entirely back to the very flippancy again on the FATF obligations and on the Global Forum obligations. Because contained in the recommendations and immediate outcomes that Global Forum recognizes should be applied using the FATF standards, we are obliged to treat with private members clubs. As you know, we're in a joint select committee. I sit as a member and therefore I'm not permitted to prematurely deal with the work that is inside the joint select committee. The legislation is born upon the back of consultation it is born upon the back of drill down of statistics, and far from what Oropuchis actually says, the Minister of Finance is for the first time 
in the history of the Ministry of Finance providing statistical information to Trinidad and Tobago, which is why I want to give a compliment to the Minister of Planning, because it is the Minister of Planning that is pushing the National Statistics Institute, something which has stood outstanding for years, which the IMF, which the international agencies, etc., have said, you have got to get your metrics right. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, these are not just mere words. Because the words are demonstrated in the fact that the Office of the Attorney General has come to this Parliament on every bill that we pilot with statistics in Trinidad and Tobago. We lay out, whether it is in respect of our children, our prisons, our court system, we lay out who and what we are based upon Trinidad and Tobago information. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, I stand in full support of the very hard work and hard task that the Minister of Finance has done and has to manage. I ask the people of Trinidad and Tobago to have patience in terms of the receipt of their monies by way of salary, etc. I ask them to never erase from their memories the bad decisions that took us to this position that we're in right now, where the price of oil, even though it's at roughly $56, $57 a barrel, mean nothing to us because of the corporation taxes write off that are permitted pursuant to a terrible decision of the last government. I ask the people of this country to bear in mind why we need taxation of this type, why we need to find money to pay salaries. You see, it's very easy for people to sit back and hope you forget, you know. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, I cannot forget every day that we manage this situation. Every day when there's a cry coming at your constituency door, as we all have, honorable members opposite and on this side, when cries come to your ministry for assistance and you just don't have the money. Mr. Deputy Speaker, far from the other side saying, this is something not to be done. The frontline speaker for the opposition has just said that they want it withdrawn and not supported. This needs to be supported now. If we are to pay a salary on time, we need revenue. It was a very famous Jamaican prime minister who said it takes cash to care, and he was right. And when you are left in an environment where some are well-fattened, well-heeled, roll into the parliament, and we hear now talk coming from other sectors, etc., about poor men, you know, I find that embarrassing. I find that, I find that an indignity to hear some voices talk about that, knowing what happened. Are we going to move beyond the realm of just knowing, you know, Mr. Deputy Speaker? It's going to be proved. And all that I can say is that this country has a due process and a balance about it. And I call upon the opposition to do the correct thing, which is to support law which they have done themselves, law which they have promoted in a manner which they now condemn only because they're in opposition, law which they know is required, and that we get on with the business of Trinidad and Tobago because we have people to feed and needs and interests as public servants as we all stand in this house to meet. I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recognize the member for Kearney Central. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The AG indicated that at the beginning that this was a matter of law, and we have no argument with that. And he proceeded then to deal with a number of legal matters. I must admit I'm not equipped to deal with, an, um, with all the legal matters that he raised. But I do want to make some corrections to things that he said that might affect the perception of the general public about the conduct and management of affairs and governance of the People's Partnership government when we were in office. And secondly, about the challenges that the present administration now faces being the government 
of Trinidad and Tobago. And the first thing that I want to mention is the issue of the Global Tax Forum. And I say that because I want to correct something that he said. He basically gave the impression, and I'm hope, I hope that I'm interpreting it right, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we had a deadline to meet in 2016, and we were in danger of missing that deadline and were likely to be blacklisted. And the Minister of Finance went up to Germany and made commitments which, in fact, uh, were not acted upon. Now, you would remember that in 2015 we had an election. And what it means then is that a deadline of 2016 in the midst of an election year becomes very, very difficult to meet on something as important as global financial commitments that have to do with the honoring of international obligation. The, if members, Mr. Deputy members, Speaker, members, I would just members, have the opportunity listen. to speak. Hold on a sec, hold on a sec. I am in the chair, member for Nakrima, all right? So do not speak before I get the opportunity to. Member for St. Joseph, finance minister, I would like to hear the member in silence, please. Kindly proceed, Karini Central. Yes. On that basis, therefore, the Minister of Finance did go to Germany. But he didn't travel alone. He went with a representative from the Board of Inland Revenue, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the reason for that is because of two issues. One, he wanted to make sure that the BIR understood, first of all, what was going on in the global forum in Germany. Secondly, what were the commitments that he was going to meet? And thirdly, to deal with the issue of the reality of continuity in a situation in which an election was imminent in 2015. On the basis of that, they got the global forum in Germany to agree to postpone the deadline in tw to 2017. The 2017 de deadline, therefore, was something known to the government of Trinidad and Tobago as government because the head of the BIR was the continuing person who remained with the information regardless of which government was in office. So the obligation to meet the 2017 deadline in a situation in which the People's Partnership lost the election in 2015, remained with the government of Trinidad and Tobago, now the Rowley government of 2015. From 2015 to 2017 is nearly two years, depending on which month you choose. It might be more than two years, but depending on what, which month that you choose. So in that period, the Attorney General, the Minister of Finance, and others who were working on this had two years in order to meet the deadline or to rectify the situation. And the deadline of 2017 was suggested and agreed upon because the BIR gave the Minister of Finance the assurance that the 2017 deadline could be met. So the first thing I want to correct is that we are responsible for something that was meant to be achieved in 2017 because we made the commitment. 
And the second thing that I want to correct is that they did not have the time or could not somehow do it because of things that we had not done or done. And therefore, clearly, this is an obligation of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. They were in office from September 8th, 2015, and it is the obligation of the government and it was the obligation of the government to meet the 2017 deadline and to achieve the objectives for Trinidad and Tobago. The second issue that I want to deal with is the matter of this uh, statistical institute. And I have no problem with the Minister of Finance complimenting the Minister for seeking to uh, establish this statistical institute and to make it a reality. But I think <clears throat> the minister knows very well that when she came to office, the statistical institute was approved by the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago. That the, our Member, cabinet. Member. The Mem statistical uh, member, yeah. leader of government business, I'm on my legs, and I would not tolerate the crosstalk. Member for Princess Town, I'm on my legs, and I will not tolerate the crosstalk also. All right, we have two more minutes, just under two minutes. We'll break for tea, so continue, member. Okay. I just want to finish this point. It may have been that the Statistical Institute as a entity was established by another cabinet. But all the actions taken to establish the institute, including preparation by the same IMF be, who were involved in it, and the, the cabinet note which indicated how that institute would be established, how it would be formulated, how the board would be formed, etc. all of that had gone to the Kamala Prasad Business Cabinet. And that is a fact, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The, there was one other matter I think that it was necessary to address, and that is the issue of. Rather than go to your next point? Yes. Right? Um, at this time, we will suspend for tea and we'll resume at 5 p.m.